Yep, can always count on NXT for a solid night of professional wrestling. Welcome back to the channel, my friends, and tonight I'm going to be reviewing NXT TakeOver In Your House, which just wrapped up airing live on the WWE Network tonight. And overall, coming out of this show immediately, I gotta say, NXT did it again. What a solid night of professional wrestling. And this show had such a unique feel to it, aside from all the other TakeOvers we've been watching. Now, what I mean by that is that this show felt like an old-school WWF In Your House pay-per-view event from the mid to late 90s. Everything from the opening video package, the commercials, Todd Pettengill shilling the merchandise and mistakenly giving out the 900 number, and the old-school In Your House entrance stage with the old-school House Titan Tron, the superstars coming out of the garage. Yeah, needless to say, I was in hook, line, and sinker. After Code Orange opens the show by performing its theme song, we kick the show off with a six-woman tag team match as Tegan Knox, Shotzi Blackheart, and Mia Yim take on Candice LeRae, Dakota Kai, and Raquel Gonzalez. Now, this match definitely felt like the right choice to open the show. You had six women who weren't in the main event, which I'll be talking about later on, and they just went out there and they tore the house down, basically. You have the established veterans of Tegan Knox, Candice LeRae, Dakota Kai, along with my local people in Shotzi Blackheart and Mia Yim, and the unknown commodity in Raquel Gonzalez, who Beth Phoenix compared a lot to China. And I can honestly see those comparisons. Raquel Gonzalez, I haven't really watched too much of, but she actually really impressed me a lot. But as an opener, this match, I think, did its purpose. It was very, very good from the opening bell. There were lots of really neat plancha spots, typical of your early 2000s opening tag match. Shotzi Blackheart also pulling out Daniel Bryan's old submission finisher from Ring of Honor, which I thought was a sweet little spot there. There were not one, but two hot tags in this match leading up to the eventual finish. As Mia and Candice battle to the back, Dakota Kai gets hit with the shiniest wizard from Tegan Knox for a surprising pinfall victory for the faces. And I only mean surprising mainly because Candice LeRae had just turned heel, so I was assuming that they would want to give her the pinfall victory here in this one. However, I for one am not opposed to the babyfaces going over in the opening match. This was definitely a solid way to kick off the show. As an opener, I feel like it definitely did its purpose. Definitely a solid tag team match otherwise known as a Teddy Long special. Speaking of specials, after the opener, we have the first of many 90s-style commercials narrated by William Regal, the NXT general manager, plugging the WWE ice cream bars. Up next, it's grudge match time as Finn Balor goes one-on-one -on -one with Damian Priest. Now, I believe around this time, Finn Balor was slated to face Walter for the NXT United Kingdom Championship, but unfortunately, due to travel restrictions, Walter has been ruled out for now, sadly. So that led to a storyline where Finn Balor basically becomes the biggest mark for the Wrestling Observer using terms like getting a push on live TV. I actually kind of like that. And I believe a few weeks ago, he was slated to have a match with the Velveteen Dream, which established a mystery attacker angle, and Finn Balor was pushed out of commission for that match. Eventually, as the weeks went on, it was revealed that the mystery attacker was Damian Priest, the Archer of Infamy. Now, personally, I was definitely not opposed to seeing this match, as like some other people were, for three reasons mainly. One, it's a fresh match that I haven't seen yet. Number two, Damian Priest, I think, is massively underrated. And number three, Finn Balor has always been one of my favorites over these last few years. And let me just say from the get-go that these two surprised the heck out of me. It was the biggest, most pleasant surprise of the entire night. It was a lot better than I was expecting going in. Very, very physical and hard-hitting match from the start. From the opening bell, Finn Balor hits that weird little corner dropkick that he does on Damian Priest, who I must say looks like an absolute monster in this match. I think this is Damian Priest's best showing on NXT TV thus far. He looked insanely dominant in some cases over Finn Balor here. Finn Balor took a lot of really scary bumps in this match. For example, he gets hit with a sidewalk slam, as well as a razor's edge, both onto the ring apron, the hardest part. That razor's edge on the apron, by the way, provided a really, really great near fall towards the finish of the match. Lots of great near falls, actually. There was another one, um, I believe Damian Priest hit Finn Balor with a top rope choke slam. And I thought that was the end right there. But nope, Finn Balor kicks out. Speaking of the finish, it came when Damian Priest had Finn Balor up on his shoulders for the Razor's Edge. Priest was basically standing on the apron, right? 
And Finn Balor is basically over the ropes into the ring in position for the razor's edge. And Priest is going to lift Balor up and unload him over the top rope, hitting a razor's edge onto the steel steps outside. But nope. Finn Balor with a nice counter. He clocks Damian Priest, knocks him off the apron. He falls onto the steel steps. Two more coup de gras later, and Finn Balor pins Damian Priest 1-2-3 in the center of the ring, clean as a whistle. Very good match here. Definitely a slower match at parts, but the pace definitely picked up towards the end, and it was extremely physical throughout. Like I said, I've always thought Damian Priest was super underrated, so it was super nice to see him get this spotlight. Still has yet to get that big win on a takeover, unfortunately, but I'm certain it'll come eventually. And Finn Balor, of course, absolutely amazing presence. He has really turned his career around with this Prince gimmick. I think he's doing some of the best work he's ever done in the WWE, if not the best work he's ever done with this company. And after the match, Mauro Ranallo on commentary also mentioned that Finn Balor now holds the record for the most wins at NXT TakeOver with 11. Sheesh, that's just insane. Overall, though, I enjoyed this match, and I definitely felt like it belonged on this card. Up next, we have the match that I personally was looking forward to the most, the NXT North American Championship match, as the champion Keith Lee defends against the challenger, the new Johnny Gargano. You know what's insane is these two have never faced off one-on-one -on -one before, at least on television. They might have wrestled at some house shows, I might be wrong about that, but their only encounters on TV have really been in tag matches, especially a couple weeks back on NXT when Gargano and Candice actually beat Keith Lee and Mia Yim. So, like I said, this is the match I was definitely looking forward to the most out of all six on the card. Keith Lee is absolutely incredible. His ceiling is so sky high his presence his charisma and his overall talent the things he can do in the ring for a man of his size everything about keith lee screams future main eventer on the main roster as well as a future world champion mark my words and as i'm sure you guys can tell johnny gargano has been my favorite act on nxt for i can't even remember how long at this point his matches on these takeover specials have always been superb his character work is always top notch and this recent heel turn he's had where he's turned into this entitled dickhead who tells the fans that they should feel lucky to see him wrestle yeah, I'm convinced Johnny Gargano can do no wrong, honestly. Johnny Gargano with the special NXT TakeOver entrance dressed in what looked like Star Wars garb. I'm not entirely sure what it was. He walks out the front door after walking past a picture of Doc Hendricks on his wall. Great entrance for him. Keith Lee comes out to what I'm convinced is wrestling's greatest theme song right now. Oh, bask in his glory. Oh, bask in his glory. And all over his gear it reads Black Lives Matter, which made me happy. Back to Johnny Gargano's Star Wars getup, there were times when the crowd in attendance was chanting Johnny Sucks to the tune of the Imperial March, which made me laugh admittedly. And as per from these two, they put on a hell of a match. I really loved the psychology with Gargano working on the injured hand and the injured eye of Keith Lee. Keith Lee's selling was super incredible in this match, as was Gargano's. Both of them really put on a show here. Gargano tries to escape through the front door that he came out of during his entrance, which he actually locked weird that he forgot which led to one of my favorite camera angles of the year as keith lee creeps up to johnny gargano and he just starts pummeling him near the front door lots of great spots like that in this match the pace definitely picked up towards the ending of the match gargano hitting a beautifully executed tope suicida onto keith lee which led to a ddt on the outside really crisp offense there and shortly afterwards keith lee pounces johnny gargano through the plexiglass hockey wall on the outside. Amazing spot there. The finish starts coming around as both men's significant others, Mia Yim and Candice LeRae, come from the back, brawling to the outside. I believe what happened is Candice tried to distract Keith Lee first. But point being, the ref is a little bit preoccupied with Mia and Candice brawling. Johnny Gargano pulls out the house key from his trunks. He puts it to Keith Lee's injured eye for a moment, hits one final beat on him for a great near fall. Man, I thought that was the end there. After many more super kicks from Johnny Gargano, Keith Lee hulks up. He hits him with the spirit bomb, then the Big Bang catastrophe. 
for the one, two, three. Keith Lee retains. Not super surprising that he did, all things considered. Johnny Gargano did have a lot of the upper hand in this feud going in. Nevertheless, I honestly would have been satisfied with either result. Kudos to both guys for putting on a great match. This was probably my second favorite match on the show, looking back at everything. Both guys looked absolutely phenomenal, and I gotta give credit where it's due. Great, great work. Up next, we have a match that I thought was going to be the last match on the show, but no, we're getting it here. It's the backlot brawl for the NXT Championship as Adam Cole defends against the Velveteen Dream. With the stipulation going in that if Velveteen Dream loses, that's his last shot at the title so long as Adam Cole holds the belt. Brace yourselves, friends. This is another cinematic match that we're getting here. We are getting spoiled with these, especially considering these last couple of months. The Velveteen Dream is one of the best entertainers in the biz right now. Adam Cole, one of the best technical wrestlers in the business right now. I was so ready for this. The ring is outdoors. It's nighttime. It's surrounded by a bunch of sedans, a bunch of cars. Adam Cole, the champion, enters first in a gigantic monster truck decked out in the Undisputed Era colors, followed by the Velveteen Dream, who enters in a beautiful yellow sports car. He comes out. Both men are wearing street clothes. Velveteen Dream dressed in a leather jacket. The announcers compared his look to Negan from The Walking Dead, which I think was an interesting comparison. These entrances almost reminded me of that video game Crush Hour. You guys remember Crush Hour, that WWE video game where all the guys got in the cars and they just started shooting? shooting at each other. The game was fun, but it was really, really dumb. Anyway, that's what these entrances reminded me of. Referee Drake Wirtz explains that it's anything goes to both men. He says that he's giving both men the spotlight in a really entertaining spot. Adam Cole tells the referee to tell Dream to put the bat down, which leads to Drake having to explain the rules again, which gave me a solid laugh. Dream tries to pin Adam Cole three times in a row with different roll-ups and inside cradles. Adam Cole immediately tries to escape, and he gets into a random sedan, which Moro Ronaldo hilariously acknowledges that Adam Cole has downgraded. But from there, we get a ton of really fun spots. Adam Cole blasts the Velveteen Dream with the fire extinguisher. As per, we get Undisputed Era member interference. Dexter Loomis creeps out from under the ring and evens the odds, chases off the rest of the Undisputed Era, puts them in the trunk of a car, and he literally kidnaps them. This match is weird, man. And of course, you have the big spot of Dream knocking Adam Cole off the top of the ladder, and Cole almost goes through the windshield of a car, which... Could not have been a fun spot to go through. It looked absolutely painful. Cole's arm was bleeding through the rest of the match. Then we get to the finish. Adam Cole attempts a Panama Sunrise, which Dream beautifully counters into a Dream Valley driver. And then he hits the purple Rainmaker on him for two very good near falls. And this is then followed up by Velveteen Dream giving him a little bit of the trash talk. Every era needs to come to an end, or something along those lines. And this trash talking eventually leads to BAM! A massive punch to the dick by Adam Cole, which he then turns into a really, really awesome Panama Sunrise onto a pile of chairs that was set up by the Undisputed Era in the middle of the ring. Adam Cole pins Velveteen Dream in the middle of the ring without any further help from his UE buddies. Who is gonna beat Adam Cole for this title? But with this finish, I do think that Velveteen Dream is moving on to the main roster sometime soon. Do not mess him up. This was definitely a fun experience. I'm not, I don't think this was better than one final beat. I don't even think it's the best cinematic match that we've gotten in these last couple of months. There were definitely some slow spots in there. There were, but. I'd be lying if I said I did not have fun with this match. I definitely did. If anyone's looking for any silver lining considering these circumstances, us wrestling fans are getting spoiled with these cinematic matches. Following that and Todd Pettengill hilariously shilling the NXT merch, we get Tommaso Ciampa taking on Karrion Cross. Now, I will admit, I have not watched a ton of Cross's work. Judging from the few things I've seen from him, his ceiling is super high. It's clear that this company is behind him and he is going to get a huge Brock Lesnar 2002 like push to the top real quick. And with Scarlett at his side as his valet, this is a truly unstoppable duo here, guys. And I believe these two, if I'm not mistaken, are dating in real life as well. So that certainly adds to their chemistry. And I personally have always had a soft spot for Tommaso Ciampa with everything he's gone through, going through the neck surgeries like he did. I've got massive respect for the dude. So I was definitely curious to see how this match would pan out. I will say that the match was not much. It was about seven minutes. Tommaso Ciampa got some brief bursts of offense in there. He did hit a Willow's Bell DDT on him for a good near fall. But most of those seven minutes were just crazy. Cross dominating him. 
The finish of the match comes around after throwing Tommaso around for a bit. Karrion Cross puts him in the cross jacket submission hold. Tommaso Ciampa fades away. He passes out. He doesn't submit. But Karrion Cross defeats Tommaso Ciampa in his first ever appearance on TakeOver. Massively impressed with Karrion Cross, And I respect that they still made Tommaso Ciampa look strong even in defeat. Again, like I said, this match was not much. Like I said, only seven minutes. But for what this match needed to accomplish, putting Karrion Cross over like they did, I honestly can't complain too much. Which brings us to our main event for the evening. The triple threat match for the NXT Women's Championship as Charlotte Flair defends against Rhea Ripley and Io Shirai. Mauro Ranallo mentioned that this was the first women's main event on a takeover since 2015 with Sasha Banks and Bayley in that fantastic Iron Woman match at TakeOver Respect. Definitely a perfectly fitting main event here. I think all three women are awesome. Yes, that does include Charlotte Flair. Deal with it. Naturally, I was super excited for this match, and they definitely delivered. This was my favorite match on the entire show. Charlotte Flair's overall command of the room, her overall presence, her overall talent, going along with Rhea Ripley's hard-hitting style as well as her overall ceiling. Adding in Io Shirai's athleticism and high-flying ability, it made for an amazing triple threat combination here. A great main event. This match I had a ton of fun with because they also found ways to utilize the in-your-house entrance. Charlotte Flair, for instance, throws Io Shirai through the window Titantron. Rhea Ripley nails Charlotte Flair with a potted plant. Not named Mitch, oddly enough. And of course, you get the big spot with Io Shirai jumping off the roof of the house onto both women. Fantastic spot. The callbacks in this match were also really, really good. Rhea Ripley nails Charlotte Flair with a top rope riptide, which is how she beat Shayna Baszler to become the champion the first time. Very close near fall there. Charlotte Flair then brings out the kendo stick and starts bludgeoning both women with it. Soon afterwards, she spears Rhea, puts her in the figure eight. But out of nowhere, Io Shirai from the top rope hits a moonsault with a nasty landing onto Rhea's face while she's still in the figure eight. Io pins Rhea Ripley, Charlotte Flair cannot break it up in time, and Io Shirai finally is your brand new NXT Women's Champion. I couldn't be more happy for Io Shirai. This was a long time coming. She's been in NXT for quite a while now. She's never won the big one up to this point. Here she finally did. Well deserved. Huge congratulations to Io for a fantastic showing. Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley both excellent showings as well. Kudos to all three women on an outstanding main event to a truly another outstanding show from NXT. They did it again, guys. I don't know if I liked this show more than Portland. I feel like I need to watch both shows again to really know which one I like more. However, I will say I think I had more fun watching this show because admittedly, I did not watch Portland live. I knew the results going in. However, this I was watching live right along with all of you guys. If you have the network, definitely check out NXT TakeOver in your house. It is not a show to be missed. From top to bottom, not a weak match on the card. Every single match did everything that it needed to accomplish. And the one match that wasn't as spectacular as it could have been, accomplished what it needed to. The show also ran just under a shade of two and a half hours as well, which is definitely an added plus. This show flew by. Very, very easy show to sit through. Obviously, can't recommend this show enough. Kudos to NXT for another great takeover. Well, guys, that's it for the review. What did you guys think of NXT TakeOver in your house? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below. And also, are there any other pay-per-view events that you guys would like to see me review on this channel? I do take requests. Thank you so much, guys, as always, for watching. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button down below if you like what you see. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button as hard as you possibly can as well so you don't miss any of my future episodes. You guys are the best. Thank you once again, as always, for watching. And with all that being said, back talk. Commence.